Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we are closing in on the last part of day four of our five-day Global Education Conference. Justin Van Fleet is here. Justin, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Justin is Chief of Staff, UN Special Envoy for Global Education. We're going to go through a couple of quick notes before we begin. The first is that there are some conference reminders from Lucy. There is a chat box on the front of the website, which is super helpful. If you have any questions or need any help, you can use that. We have uh, the hashtag global at 13 running. Um, there will be an evaluation form that will pop up when the session finishes. We do really appreciate your feedback. Thanks for taking any time you have to fill that out. Uh, we do have over 90 conference partners. These are schools, nonprofit organizations. We would love to add your organization to that list if you are a non-commercial or an educational institution. And please do go to the Global Education Conference website for continued conversation, especially on the Global Education Declaration, which we started on Monday, and the five grassroots projects. Thanks. Uh, huge thanks to our conference sponsors and supporters, especially IRM and the Global Campaign for Education, keeping this conference for free. We really appreciate it. This is a chance for those of you in the live studio audience to let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. I'm going to click on it twice. And then it's fun if you put a note in the chat, the time, the temperature, anything else you can tell us. We'll move off of the map, but keep those notes in the chat going. It especially be fun for Justin to see the variety of locations represented in the conference. Justin, I'm going to turn the time over to you. I will be keeping track of any questions that come up in the chat, and feel free to call on me if you need some help, and then I'll help moderate a Q&A at the end if there's time. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Steve. I really appreciate that introduction. And it's so great to see so many people from literally all over the world on the map. I saw a lot of folks um, in the east and west coast of the United States and the Middle East, some folks in Europe and, and Latin America. So it's a really great turnout. Some of you, it's a little bit later in the day than for others. So I appreciate you staying up for this and hopefully you find our uh, chat and discussion this evening um, or this afternoon or this morning based on where you're at. Extremely informative and helpful. I'm really looking forward to it. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Ed and the U.S. chapter of the Global Campaign for Education for inviting me to be part of this um, keynote address and this entire Global Education Conference this week. Um, I know they're getting ready to celebrate a 10-year anniversary, and so I want to give a big congratulations to them. And the title of the presentation, as you can all see on the screen, is Putting Global Education First, How to Achieve a World at School. And I want to start out by just giving a quick introduction um, to myself and let you know who I am. So as Steve mentioned, my name is Justin Van Fleet, and I am the Chief of Staff to the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education, Gordon Brown. And our offices are based here in New York City. Now, before we get started, I would like to ask a question to everybody out there. And my question is, I'd like you to raise your hand if you ever had to worry about whether or not you would be able to go to school. Um, so I'm talking primary school, elementary school. Raise your hand. And now I know I'm not going to be able to see you if you raise your hand, but in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you can click a button to raise your hand. So again, raise your hand if you had to worry about whether or not you'd be able to go to primary school. And I know that it seems like there are a few of you um, that may have some interesting stories to share with the rest of us. But for the most people out there, it seems like actually it wasn't a big worry. It wasn't something that you were necessarily have to be concerned about. And I have to be honest that I'm the, I'm the same way. I grew up in western Maryland, um, sort of out in the Appalachian Mountains, a small town. And there was a one day where I woke up and had to worry about whether or not 
I would be able to go to school or whether or not my family would be able to afford to send me to school, um, whether or not I had to worry about whether it was a fee for me to go to school. And so that was fortunately the reality that I grew up in. And so many people ask me, why is it that you work um, for the UN Special Envoy for Global Education? Why are you interested in global education? And it's a really easy answer for me. Um, when I was 15 years old, my big dream at the, at the age of 15 was to learn to speak Spanish. And I uh, applied to be a foreign exchange student. And I said, I'll go anywhere in the world. I just want to learn Spanish. And I needed a scholarship at the time. So I was told if I was more flexible, um, I'd be more likely to get a scholarship. And lo and behold, I was, I was accepted to a program and I was sent to Bolivia. And I had to look at the globe and figure out where in the world Bolivia was. I had never really heard of it, to be honest. And it was one of the best experiences of my life, and it opened up so many opportunities, and I learned so much from that. But that was the first time in my entire life I had ever realized that me being able to get up and go to school in the morning wasn't the reality for everyone around the world. And in fact, it was most people's reality, or a lot of people had a reality that was quite different. And I remember Paulina, who was the woman that worked for us in, in the house and did household chores. She was my exact same age, but wasn't in school. And I can remember the kids that would sit outside and, and shine shoes, and they would look in underneath the school gate, and they were outside working and not in school. And at that moment that I realized, to me, education meant opportunity. And it was a right that I had growing up that I wanted everyone else to have as well. And so I think, you know, all of you came to this presentation for one reason or another, and I know that we're using the hashtag GlobalEd13, and my question to you is, you know, for me, education is opportunity. What does education mean to you? And so I'd like everyone out there to get on Twitter and tweet out at A World at School at Justin Van Fleet and use our hashtag today, and just let everybody know what education means to you. Um, why is education important? What drew you to this presentation today? Now, just to give a quick overview of what I'm going to speak about to give you um, an idea of where we're headed over the course of the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, first, I'm going to do, what I want to do is introduce uh, the Office of the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education, give you a sense of who, you, who we are, what we do, and who we work with. And then I want to give a general overview of education globally. Where are we and how do we get to the place that we're at? And I'm going to make the point that I think we're at we are really experiencing a crisis in global education. And I'm going to give you a, a snapshot of what that global crisis looks like on both the access front, being able to go to school, and the learning front, the quality of education young people receive around the world. And then I want to end by talking a little bit about how we can make sure education is a global priority. What does it mean to deliver on our promise of education for all? and what people can do right now to get involved and get involved and be engaged in realizing education for all children around the world. So to start out, I'll go first to our office. So I work for Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and he's the UN Special Envoy, appointed by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2012. And our office has one very specific goal that we would like to achieve. We would like to ensure that by the end of 2015, Every child and young person around the world has the opportunity to go to school and to learn. And we are really keen on being able to raise the profile of education globally and mobilize the political will at both the global, national, and subnational levels to accelerate progress on financing of education and the delivery of education, specifically to the most poor and marginalized and, and the people that are missing out. And we do this through a variety of ways, working with a variety of different people. Um, we raise the political profile of education by visiting different countries, speaking with heads of state, presidents, prime ministers, ministers of education, ministers of finance, governors, teachers themselves, working with young people. We have a Youth Courage Award program that honors young people and their commitment to education. Working with the business community and getting them more involved in the process. Working with a broad array of multilateral and bilateral donors and partners in the education space. And I think that's the most important thing about what we're doing in our office is that we have a big task, but it's not our task alone, and it's not one that we can do in isolation. And that's why we work with a broad network of partners. Now, I mentioned that Mr. Brown was appointed by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, 
and he's taking a tremendous leadership role in global education. And in that same year, in 2012, he launched the Global Education First Initiative. And this is his trademark initiative to really put out there on the global agenda education and say that education must be the first priority if we want to unlock all of the other rights that we also believe in. And there are three priorities of the Global Education First Initiative. The first is to put every child in school, which is relatively uh, simple and straightforward in terms of what it means. The second is improving the quality of learning, so making sure that young people are in school and actually learning while they're there. And the third priority is to foster global citizenship, so to ensure that while young people are in school and learning, that they're learning the values that we need in a global society to promote stability, peace, harmony, and social development, economic growth, and everything, the core values that we believe in um, is sort of the core nature of, of human beings and, and humanity. So those are the three priorities laid out by the Secretary General. And as I mentioned, our office and the Secretary General's office, we can't do this alone. And so we work with a broad array of partners through the Global Education First Initiative to reach the goal of getting all children in school learning with the values of global citizenship instilled. And as we travel the world and we visit different countries, see different programs on the ground, it's really fascinating to see all of the great work different partners are doing. I, I remember when we very first launched the Education First Initiative, we traveled to Timor-Leste, and we went to witness a UNESCO program, um, which was an adult literacy program. And it was really exciting to see these adults who before were unable to read and write, writing their name and demonstrating these skills they had gained through that program. We visited Pakistan, and we've seen the great work that UNICEF's doing on the job on the ground there um, to enroll girls into school in some of their programs. We visited Nigeria not too long ago, and we, we saw some of the great work that a British Airways-sponsored program is doing to put girls and boys in the school, including um, we also spoke with the USAID team on the ground and discussed some of their new exciting programs in the northern part of Nigeria. So reaching this goal that we have for ourselves is not something we can do by ourselves, and we work with a broad group of partners and also new sets of partners. So one of the things we're trying to do is bring in the business community and ensure that business leaders are taking a stand on global education. So we work closely with the UN Global Compact and a lot of different businesses that are part of the Global Business Coalition for Education. Those uh, companies are working to engage their employers or their employees and their consumers in education to get them more engaged in that. And then it's very important that I point out that we can't do work on global education if we're not putting young people front and center. And so we work directly with youth themselves. We're, we can't talk about education without the active engagement of young people. So we've worked with partners such as the UN Foundation, and UNFPA, and a broad group of others that are really keen on working with young people. The, there's a youth advocacy group that we've set up for the Global Education First Initiative. The photo here is from the Malala Day event that was held in July at the UN Chamber that brought together young people from all over the world, from over 80 countries, all focused on one goal, which is getting young people into school and learning. So to summarize, our goal is to accelerate progress to get more children into school and learning, and it's something that we can't do alone, and that's why we're working with this broad group of partners. So one thing that you might be saying, you know, in school and learning, that's not very new, is it? How long has this been around? I've been hearing about this for a while. And the answer is yes, it actually has been around for a while, and it's not new, and we're putting a huge priority on this issue for some key reasons. And what I'd like to do is just take a step back in time and answer the question, where are we and how did we actually get here? So I'm going to ask everyone to sort of get in a, a time machine, and we're going to go back 23 years ago to 1990. Um, so in 1990, um, if you were listening to the radio, I think you may have been hearing New Kids on the Block at that time that, during that year. Um, you know, it's a year after the Berlin Wall's fallen down. So think back to 1990 and where you were. In 1990, where I want to specifically take us to is Jum Tien in Thailand at the World Conference on Education for All. And at the World Conference on Education for All, there was a promise made by the global community. The promise was that we will ensure by the year 2000 that we will have universal access to learning. 
So this is in 1990, and we're setting a goal for 10 years from 1990, saying we want universal access and learning. Now, at that time, there were about uh, a little over 100 million children out of school. The majority of them were girls. And this was called the Education for All Agenda. So if we fast forward to the year 2000, where did we get to? Well, we renewed our commitment to Education for All, and then we also had the Millennium Development Goals released. And two goals were specific to education. Uh, universal primary education by 2015, and gender parity at all levels of education, preferably by 2005. Now, some of you might be a little puzzled and confused, and if you look at that, it does seem a little confusing. So why were we making commitments in 2000 to something that we were supposed to have achieved by then? And the unfortunate reality is that on the ground, very little had changed. If we looked at the number of out-of-school children in 2000, we still had 113 million children out of school. 60 million of those children were girls. And so we needed a renewed commitment to education. And if you look at MDG2, universal primary education, I remember a former boss of mine, Gene Sperling, who now works in the White House, he used to say that's the most ambitious yet pathetic goal the world has ever come up with. Ambitious for the reason that we, wanted, we had 113 million children out of school, and we wanted to get every single child into school by the end of 2015. Pathetic because we said we wanted to get children into primary school. What about secondary school? What about early childhood? And we also told young people that they had to wait 15 years for us to hit that goal. So that's why I found that a really interesting statement, that the goal that we set was both very ambitious but at the same time pathetic in terms of what we wanted to achieve. So why don't we fast forward to today, 2013, 23 years later after we set the goal of universal access to learning. Where have we gotten ourselves to? Well, today at a 2013 snapshot, 57 million children are out of school, and a little over half of those are girls. And many would look at that and say, that is tremendous progress, and I completely and totally agree. We have decreased the out-of-school number by over 50 million in just 13 years. These are children enrolling into school, having new opportunities. But the reality of the situation is while this is progress, we're leaving many children behind. And we're at 2013 right now. We have two more year years until the end of 2015, which is our goal to get every single child into school and learning. And so with that said, who are the people that we're leaving behind? today in 2013. And what I'd like to do is give you a snapshot of the 57 million children we have yet to reach with the promise of universal education. And for each group that I'm going to point out and highlight their story and sort of why they're mo some of the most marginalized young people and why, th why they're not in school, I also want to give you a story of hope so I can demonstrate it doesn't actually have to be this way and that there are great people out there doing hard, inspirational work to get people into school in these diff difficult situations and circumstances. And, you know, I've had the very fortunate perspective from this vantage point to visit some of these different countries and, and see and meet with some of these young people and hear their stories and hear the stories of people working hard to make sure that we can reach our goal of, of all children in school and learning. So if we look at the 57 million children that are out of school, we can call them so they, you know, the forgotten children, the ones that are being left behind. 15 million children are not in school because they're actually working instead of going to school. And so it's a, it, from that perspective, from a family, you know, they're actually making a conscious decision that based on the opportunities that are laid out to them, it makes much more sense for them to send their child to work or for a child to go to work and earn money for the family than it does for them to go into a school. And that could happen for a variety of reasons. There may not be a school. It may be an economic issue of poverty. It may be low quality of the opportunities to go to school that exists and the quality of learning. And, you know, as we look at that, you might say, wow, that's tremendous, 15 million children who are working in school. There's nothing we can do about that. Well, two weeks ago, I was in Asia, and I was meeting with the head of Save the Children's Education Programs in Bangladesh, and they're doing amazing, amazing things to be able to take young boys and girls um, who are working and give them educational opportunities. We also traveled to India this past year, and we went to one of the programs run by the Global March Against Child Labor. 
Kailash Satyarsi and his group, and I met this young woman, Razia, who was rescued from child labor, who was stitching soccer balls. And she's now in school, completed school, and what she does, she's dedicated her life to helping other young girls move from the exploitation of work and into education. And it's truly amazing work that they're doing there. I mean, the other group of children, part of these 20, uh, 57 million out-of-school children, are girls who are wed, child brides, forced into marriage. 25,000 girls each day are forced in to marriage, and they're not able to go, and go into school. And this is criminal that we let this happen today. Um, but at the same time, there are amazing things out there that are happening. There is a group, the Wedding Busters, working in Bangladesh and Ethiopia to go around as a group of young boys and girls who actually try to convince families that they shouldn't let their girls be married off, that they should let them stay in school. Um, there are child marriage-free zones being set up by different nonprofit organizations such as Plan International. There's work of Girls Not Brides on the ground to help ensure that these young girls actually have the opportunity of education. When we look at the 57 million children, we also have children affected by conflict, and over half of the children not in school are children affected by conflict. And this is you know, what's happening in Syria right now and other conflicts around the world this is a huge issue. These are children who are displaced in their own countries. They're refugee children. They're living in host countries. They may be in camps. They may be integrated into new communities. Um, and so this is a huge, huge issue with over half of the world's out-of-school children, children affected by conflict. But there are groups like INEE, whose partner network is working day in and day out to be able to deliver education in these very tough circumstances and environments. We were just updated the other day by UNICEF on the response to their work in Syria and what's happening on the ground there. So despite the fact that this is such a huge challenge, there are so many things happening right now to be able to enroll young children in the school and give them opportunities to, to learn uh, despite being affected by conflict in, those, in the situations they're in. Of the 57 million children who are not in school, remember that still over half of these children are girls. And depending where you are in the world, the number could actually be much more. It could be two-thirds to three-quarters of the children out of school are girls. Um, and I know that you know, it doesn't take a lot to – everybody, I think if you, I could ask you all to raise your hands. Everyone here is going to be – is going to know who Malala is. And I think we've all been inspired by her personal story and what she's doing to help raise awareness about the issue of girls' education and ensure that more girls are, are being able to, to go to school and learn and that we're doing things to, to confront the discrimination against girls and, and enact new policies that can incentivize families to send their girls to school. When we look at the 57 million out-of-school children, we also have children who have special needs and children with disabilities. You know, of that group, 4 million children are blind and not in school because of the uh, visual impairment. And so if we're looking at the 57 million children and special provisions that need to take place, we need to do something to address the needs of children with disabilities so that they're able to go to school. Um, and I'd like everyone here to meet Ashwini. She's one of the winners of this year's uh, Youth Courage Awards. And Ashwini has such an amazing story, and it's one of those stories of hope that really shows us that if we put our mind to it, we're able to deliver education to, to young people, even, even children with disabilities, that it's not rocket science. Ashwini grew up in, in, in India, and she grew up with a visual impairment. She was ridiculed um, for not being able to see. Children made fun of her, but she fought during those years to be able to go to school, and she struggled, and she stayed in school, got out of school, and not only was offered an amazing technology job at Microsoft, but hear this, she turned down her job at Microsoft so that she could work with Leonard Chester Disability and go around India and help enroll children in the school who have visual impairment. So this is the story of a young girl who, against all odds, made it through school, and then instead of taking a great job, is actually out there helping young, young girls and boys like herself have the opportunity of an education. So while we are making progress, and while we have made progress in the last 13 years since we've started our quest to get education for all and hit MDG2, we're still leaving behind these 57 million children. And I'd like to just point out that I really believe that we can't stop now. And what I want to point out there is despite these success stories, I want to ask you, are we facing a global education access and learning challenge? 
and you can all vote yes or no. Um, you know, by in the chat box, you can say what you think, whether you think we are or we're not. But my answer is definitely yes. We are facing a global education challenge, and we need to have a serious response to this challenge. So when I look at the global education crisis, we have to realize that, first of all, we're two decades late. We made a promise in 1990. We moved the goalpost to 2000, and then we moved it to 2015. And we haven't been able to deliver for all of the children. There are still the 57 million children who are not in school. And if we were being graded on this, if this was a homework assignment, I've done some math. And unfortunately, it looks like as a global community, we would be getting an F. You know, if we've enrolled 56 million children and our target was 113, that's not even 50%, and we only have two more years left to go. On top of this, progress is stalled. For the past three years, the out-of-school numbers hovered between 57 and 61 million. We actually haven't been decreasing at the rates that we had earlier. You know, in the first five years of the MDG, and um, in Education for All in 2000, from 2000 to 2005, we saw dramatic decreases in the out-of-school number. But now we've sort of plateaued, and even worse is the numbers actually on the rise in sub-Saharan Africa. There are more children out of school today in Africa than there were yesterday because, or, and the day before and the year before because of population growth and our inability to be able to create the school spaces and provide opportunities for learning. Um, to match up with the growth in population. So despite some of those tremendous gains, I really think that we have to give ourselves um, a, a failing grade or a not passing grade for sure in terms of our ability to meet the MDG by 2015. Now this global education crisis also has another dimension to it, is that there are a quarter billion children who have enrolled into school, but they're actually not learning. We have more and more data coming out right now um, that's been coming out over the past few years showing that even after two, three, four, and five years of school, young people are coming out unable to read and unable to write. And that's just not acceptable. At the same time, we have decreased in funding for education. So while the out-of-school numbers on the rise in Africa, while we're seeing low returns in some places in terms of people not be, young children not learning despite going to school, we're decreasing financing for education. And then if we look beyond primary school, we have a global skills crisis where we have tens of millions of more children not in secondary school, including 34 million girls that are denied the opportunity. And this is the crucial age where young people can bridge basic skills into life skills and opportunities for employment um, later on in life. And so this is a huge, huge crisis. And so while I'm going to focus more on this 2015 goal, there's other dimensions to the global education crisis that we have to address at the same time. And I think all of this begs in the final two years to the end of 2015, as we approach the state, what is the decision we are going to make? Do we want to hit the goal of getting all children into school and learning, or do we want to move the goalpost again? And this is a tough decision we want to make. So, you know, maybe put it in the chat box. I see Tosca there saying she wants to hit the goal. I agree. I'm a person that says I think we should hit the goal. Um, I'm curious what other people out there think. Do we want to move the goal post and, you know, tell these young people that actually not 2015, it's 2030, and so it's 40 years beyond us setting the first goal. Um, you have to wait actually 40 years before we can deliver universal education for every child around the world. And like I said, my answer is we need to get as close to zero children out of school by the end of 2015. And I'm going to tell you how, and I'm going to tell you why. So why? It's ambitious, but it's also possible. The thing that we need most is will, political will, and will of different organizations to actually deliver education. We don't need a scientific discovery. It's not some grand mystery, how do you put more children into school. We've been able to send a man to the moon. We've been able to sequence DNA. I am sitting here in New York City speaking with some people in the Middle East, in Latin America, in the United States, and Europe, and Africa, all at the same time. And if we can do that, we can definitely ensure that children can go to school. And I say that because we know what needs to happen. 
we know that we need more financing. We need more resources from domestic government, and we need more international support. We know that we need to provide treat, we need to train 2 million more teachers, provide professional development support for those teachers so they actually are in decent living conditions and can teach um, and use their talents and skills to educate the next uh, generation. We need to build more classrooms and infrastructure. And when I say classrooms, it doesn't even necessarily mean four walls and a, and a chalkboard in front of the room. We live in 2013, and there are so many more ways that we can conceptualize what it means to learn and have an opportunity to learn using technology and also using community schools and using households and all different types of ways that we can conceptualize learning. We know that we need to get incentives for the most marginalized, especially those affected by poverty. Girls, we need to create incentives that it makes sense for child laborers to be able to move from exploitation into education, that there is something out there to support the families, that labor isn't the only option for children. We know that education has to be relevant. We know that what we're teaching and what we're talking about has to make sense to the young people in those communities in which they're living, so they're able to create a future for themselves and for their communities. We know that we have to create safe spaces to learn. We have to create safe pathways so that young people can go to school and not fear that they're going to be attacked, not fear that they'll be subject to violence or rape or anything of that nature. So we know what needs to happen. So that's another reason why I think we should work as hard as possible and get to as close to the, to the goal of zero children out of school by the end of 2015. Another reason why is because a right one cannot be unwon easily. And what I mean by that is once we're able to get young people into school with a decent learning opportunity, it's really hard to take that away from people. And this is the progressive realization of rights. So as we get more and more people into school, it will be more and more difficult for governments to stop funding education or decrease funding for education. So if we give a big push now to the end of 2015, we're getting that closer to a universal education that will be sustainable in the longer term. The other reason why I think we need to put as much effort into reaching these 2015 goals as possible is because we need to lay the groundwork for a legitimate post-2015 agenda. So for those of you out there that might follow what's happening in the UN processes right now and with the global policy agendas, we'll be coming up with a new set of goals for development in 2015 that will replace the Millennium Development Goals. So what we can do is we can either stop, make a new set of goals. Um, there's been a lot of talk about setting goals for learning, so it's not just getting kids into school, but making sure that young people are leaving with the learning that we want them, the skills, the knowledge, the attitudes that young people should have. And I think that's a great goal for us to have as a global community. But we, have, we can't go forward and set a new goal if we don't deliver on the first set of goals. And so that's the first myth that I want to debunk is that access and learning are two different agendas. And in fact, you can't have one without the other. We can't enroll kids in the school if we're not going to provide learning opportunities because they won't stay there. And we can't get all children learning if we don't provide a way for all children to go into school. And so the only way that we can have a legitimate post-2015 agenda is if we get a long, hard push to the end of 2015 to get as many children into school and learning as possible and reach that first goal so that our next set of goals are legitimate um, for children around the world and for the global community. And the last reason why is because it's the right thing to do for our societies, for our economies, and for the health, wealth, and well-being of the children that we're talking about around the world. For us to go and tell young people that actually we're going to postpone it again, you have to wait 40 years before we can realize education for all children, it's criminal. And that shouldn't be the agenda that we're putting forward. Now, throughout the presentation up until now, you've heard a little bit of different examples of success. And if we're going to deliver on our promise, if we want to reach that point where we have all children in school and learning, what do we need to do? And you've heard what some people are doing around the world and all the different organizations out there, and we need to do more of it, and we need to do better at what we're doing. And what it really is going to take is a significant amount of will and determination with a laser focus on those goals that we have of getting all children into school and learning. And some of the things, I'll just recap here, some of, the, some of the things that we're going to have to deal with and that we are dealing with with some of our partners is identifying some of the solutions for those critical bottlenecks at the country and local level keeping children out of school. 
So we have an initiative that we've been working on with the World Bank, the Global Partnership for Education, um, the UN country teams on the ground, and all the different UN agencies called Learning for All. And we're asking certain countries to look at what are two to three critical bottlenecks holding back progress on access and learning to reach the 2015 goal, and what are two to three critical solutions that if we injected some domestic resources, international resources into these solutions, we could accelerate progress on access and learning. So we need to get better at identifying bottlenecks but then actually delivering on those solutions. And delivering on those solutions means that we have to mobilize financing and that we have to ensure effective delivery of that, uh, with that money, that we're using money to the best effect. And financing isn't just for donor agencies, but it's also for governance and governments themselves to invest more money in education. We need to look at innovative new sources of financing, and we need to look at what people themselves can do, the public can do, to contribute to ensuring that we have the financing we need to get to go that final mile and to get every child into school and learning. And then we have to address some of those cross-cutting issues that we discussed earlier. There's no way we can achieve our learning goals and education goals if we don't ban child labor and ensure that all children have an opportunity that isn't working, that there is an opportunity to go to school and learn. We have to do more work on child, labor, or child marriage and ensuring that young girls have an option to stay in school and, and have the opportunity to learn and, and, and gain skills, knowledge, and attitudes that they want instead of being married off at young ages. We have to find a way to provide education for children with disabilities. We have to do more to train and support teachers. And so that is what has to happen if we want to get every child into school and learning and we want to deliver on our promise. But more important or most important is we need citizen mobilization. We need to connect people to opportunities to make a difference. And we need everyone to be involved. We need young people involved. We need faith groups involved. We need businesses involved. We need philanthropists involved. And we need teachers involved. We need everyone around the world doing their part to ensure that education is the first thing on the global agenda, that we're going to reach our 2015 goal, get every child into school and learning. And then after we do that, we're going to raise the bar even higher and say we want every child to have a certain amount of basic skills, knowledge, and, attitude, and attitudes that they can come out of an education with. And so that's the direction we need to be moving in. And the only way we can do this is if we all work together. Now, in this quest for broad-based engagement in education, there's a lot of work already happening out there. And I want to raise to everyone's attention just one particular example of a way you right now can get involved and get engaged in global education. I'd like to introduce you to the A World at School campaign, which is a digital platform that connects people to organizations and opportunities to take action. And so if you were to go to this website now, it's not about the A World at School activities and what A World at School is doing. It's about what all of the partners are doing out there. So right now, you can go and support a campaign that Avaz is doing on Kenya on violence against women. You can go and support the work that UNICEF is doing in Syria. You can connect with WFP and OCHA and UNHCR on some of their work with humanitarian relief and education. You can join up with Walk Free and the work that they're doing on child slavery. You can join the girls' education campaign with Malala. And so this is a way of crowdsourcing all of the different activities that are happening in global education and connecting you to those opportunities. There's a social networking dimension of it on Twitter, Facebook, um, and Tumblr that you can all engage with and participate in. There's over 200,000 people in the email network, and, a, and we've had action campaigns. We have over a million actions taken on individual petitions that we run through our world at school. So if you want to join a global movement of people taking action and find ways that you can get connected to those organizations doing things to make education a reality, then I'd encourage you all to go and check out A World at School and, and, and join up on Facebook and, and Twitter and all the other social media outlets that you can engage with. And some may ask, well, this is all great, but what does this really work? What does this look like? Does it actually work? Are there ways that we can actually come together as a bunch of different partners to deliver um, education for, for the most marginalized and for children that are being left behind? And I'd like to just give an example right now of a campaign and an activity that's being undertaken by a group of unlikely partners maybe five or ten years ago that is really going to have a tremendous impact. So if we look at the crisis right now in Syria, it's a primary example of a place where education falls through the cracks. Um, when it comes to humanitarian 
support, education receives one of the lowest amounts of money um, out of all the other buckets of, of the sectors that, that receive financing in those types of crises. And if we look at the Syria crisis alone, we have over 2 million children who are out of school because of the, con the conflict. 1 million children are refugees outside of their own host home country. And Lebanon alone is host to 500,000, almost 500,000 refugee children and youth. And so we have right now a huge humanitarian crisis and a potential of 2 million children as part of a lost generation. These could be 2 million children that we decide as a global community not to provide education to and not to make provision for. So I'd like to give you an example of what it looks like when a team comes together to address the global education crisis. So this past summer, a world at school supported um, Kevin Watkins of the Overseas Development Institute to go to Lebanon and assess the situation on the ground. And Kevin came back with a report that you can read on the World at School website that highlighted some of the challenges but laid out a solution to get the refugee children in Lebanon into school, so the Syrian refugees into Lebanon, to find a way that we can double shift schools, hire um, Syrian refugees to be teachers in those schools, use some of the existing infrastructure. This report was presented to our office, the UN Special Envoy for Global Education, and we hosted a meeting of donors um, here in September in, in New York um, to look at the plan and identify what donors could do to help support this plan and what different agencies could do to make it operational. Um, we worked with the Youth Envoy for Global Education and we worked with Turner, who is the Secretary General's um, Global Education First Initiative. He's on the steering committee and he's the youth representative. And together they formed a Youth Education Crisis Committee to respond to this crisis and to get young people involved in the response. UNICEF with GPE and UNHCR and a, and a broad set of partners are on the ground now developing the operational proposal, um, the, the operational plan in terms of how we actually roll this out in practice. Western Union, one of the member companies of the Global Business Coalition for Education, came to us and said, hey, we really want to get involved in this and we know that financing is a part of this. We have over 300,000 locations globally where we can collect money. We have agents out there that can collect money. What we can do is we can allow a fee-free transaction so anyone anywhere in the world can walk up to a Western Union agent, contribute to a fund, and it would be transferred um, with, no, with no money cut out of this. So we said, great, let, let's go ahead and set that up. The Global Business Coalition for Education has developed a kit for companies to engage their over one million employees in that giving and education campaign. We reached out and we're working with the different partners of the Global Education First Initiative to promote this and get more young people and more organizations involved. And I'm giving you all a sneak peek at the bottom of the screen. Um, in the next few days, launching the Award at School site, there'll be a toolkit for young people and organizations to find out ways that they can get involved and raise their voice and spread the word and make an impact on education for the children in Syria. And it will include all sorts of things, including what to do when you go to a Western Union store. So you, can, you don't have to have a bank account. You don't have to have a credit card. Um, you can actually walk in with $5 to $500,000, whatever it is, and Western Union is going to match the first $100,000, so it actually doubles the donation. And we'll be able to create a fund and deliver towards this plan of getting children into school in this crisis. And if we look at this, this is a, a group of, you know, five, ten partners coming together to really do something different and to really accelerate progress and address the crisis head on so that we can avoid that lost generation and ensure that we're moving more children into school as we head towards the uh, end of 2015 and that we're laying a baseline for an ambitious post-2015 where, where we want all children in school and learning. So as you can tell from this presentation, we have an awful lot of work to do. But I want everyone to know that if we are determined and we have a sense of determination, we have a sense of focus and we all work together, we could be the first generation to have every child in school and learning. And I think I would like to encourage and challenge all of us to become part of that and make that a reality. And so I put up some different um, URLs here. If you want to check out our office, the Office of the UN Special Envoy for Global Education, it's just educationenvoy.org. You can see what we're doing there. It would be great if you went to the Global Education First Initiative website and you can learn what all the different partner organizations are and some of the different activities that are happening over there. And again, I mentioned the Aurora School Campaign, and you can go and team up with a variety of different partners and take some direct action there. 
um, through that initiative. And in the coming days, we'll be rolling out that program on Syria, and I hope everyone here will participate in it and get excited and involved. I see Tariq is, is out there. He's already championing and saying everybody should get involved in the movement. And I want to know what everyone out there is going to do to create a world at school. So um, if you're out there on Twitter, um, use hashtag GlobalEd13 and let us know what are you going to do to create a world at school. And with that, Steve, I know I think we have a little bit of time left. I'm happy to take questions. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and moderate that section. We do have about 10 minutes. Um, if you have a question for Justin, you can raise your hand. It's it. Uh, I'm giving you the microphone privilege. I believe you raised your hand to ask a question. To do so, you click on the top button at the top left. Hello. Uh, nice to say a great uh, thank you to the to the speaker and uh, to everyone involved. First, and um, yeah, I wanted to ask how. I know you've given some information about how we can get involved at a world at school and various websites, but um, how do you feel that you know university students can spread this message you know faster uh, and disseminate this information faster? Uh, that's basically my question. Great, that's an that's an excellent question. I think university students are some of the best advocates and ambassadors we can have out there right now for global education. Um, you know, if you go to these websites, it's a great way to get the information and start to get informed. But I think the next step is to get linked up with these organizations and actually do something, get more people involved. You know, as a young university student, you've seen what the value of education is. You know what education means to you. And so I think it would be great if you can make sure that all of your peers know about it and then pick a project, pick an initiative, and do something. You know, it could be a whole host of things. You could do a, a group fundraiser, you know, do some type of activity or an event to raise awareness and raise money for, for some type of initiative to get more young people into school. You know, I think, you know, if you look at some of the global averages, for as little as $150, you could be able to educate a young person for a year. I think that in, in Syria and some of the the programs there, it's around in that ballpark, you know, $200, $300. You know, and so you could start to come up with some creative ways to do fundraising. I think the other thing is we need to make this a global issue in a way that lets political leaders around the world know that we're serious, that we're not completely complacent and going to let this goal be punted another 10 to 15 years. And so I think, you know, any type of, of activism that involves letting leaders know that this is important. It could be through petitions, through um, you know, peaceful demonstrations, all sorts of creative ways that you can raise visibility and let people know that this is front and center on our global agenda and that we're not going to stop making noise until we've reached our goal. And so I think that's another great way. Uh, another thing for university students would be to partner with the schools in your community where your uni university is based. You could get involved and do volunteer programs in the school, go in and get high school students, middle school students, even primary school students engaged in the issue. And from there, we can just start to snowball and really build a movement. So I think as university students, you're uniquely placed to have an impact. And I'd really encourage you to do that. And you can get in touch with our team over here, and we can come back with even more ideas to engage with you on that. Justin, in the chat, uh, Joseph asked, uh, it is great that there is a cadre of people interested in education for all other issues, such as people in this session. But how do you see the way to mobilize a broader group of people, many of whom are preoccupied with other, more personal, more pressing domestic issues? Well, I think there are two things to that. I think the first thing is, if you truly believe in this cause, then the most effective way that other people can be convinced to get involved is for you to talk with them and speak with them and tell them what you've learned and what you know about this. Because people are more in influenced to do things if one of their peers talks to them and gets them involved. And by doing something like this, it's not in any way can be competing with other areas of importance. There are many, many things that are important in our world that we need to stand up for and we need to make a difference on. But it doesn't mean that we can't have one that we think is um, really important to us where we can go the extra mile on. And I don't think we have to set up a dichotomy between a domestic issue versus a global issue because education is a human issue. It's about people regardless of borders, regardless of where they live, in our country, in the country that you live in, in a neighboring country, in the country on the other side of the world. 
it's a human issue in the fact that we cannot be here in 2013 and be complacent with the fact that young people are denied the opportunity to go to school. And given that, it's not an issue of one country versus another. It's an issue of can we, as a global community, really come together and be the first generation to realize um, something so basic yet so ambitious as every child in school and every child learning. And I'd also like to highlight, you know, that there are really important connections. If you're speaking with people who um, are really fixated on domestic issues, that given the interconnectedness of the world, education in other countries around the world um, is a source of stability. It's a source of economic growth. It's a source of social development. It's a source of better health, wealth, nutrition. And by fostering those items in different countries, you're able to get, um, it's able to create benefits for not just that country, but for other countries around the world. It helps promote trade and growth. It helps um, increase tolerance and understanding. And so by investing in education in one country, it actually has an impact and a ripple effect that goes much broader than just that community. But it truly is a global investment. Tariq, I've given you a microphone capability. If you want to turn your microphone on, you click on the talk button at the top left. Okay, I have two questions here. The first question about the number of the boys and girls who do not go to school. You mentioned that the number is about 57, uh, 57 million. I think it's a very big number. How can we guarantee this is a real number? The second point, if we are talking to individuals to participate in this movement, it's okay. But how can we uh, persuade and convince the governments to share in this movement. Thank you. Great. Those are two excellent questions. Um, in terms of the out-of-school number, it's really the best guest estimate that we can come up with. Um, the number is determined by the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, which is a global clearinghouse, and UNESCO has all of the, all of the data on education from all of the different ministries of education, on who's in school and who's out. And so every year they publish the global monitoring report. Um, and that's another great resource if you're interested in learning more about the numbers and where people are in and out of school um, is to check out um, the, the EFA Global Monitoring Report by UNESCO. And Pauline Rose is, is the director of that, and they've done some tremendous work over there. And in that, it actually breaks down by country where the out-of-school population is. And the most fascinating part of this is that if you look at those numbers, over half of the out-of-school population is in less than 10 countries. And so if we can get the financing and delivery and political will right in just 10 countries, we're well over halfway to our goal. And I know uh, I saw somebody from a world at school, and, and Mara, it looks like Mara's also put up some links to UNESCO and to the EFA report in there. So that's great in the, in the chat box if you want to check that out for more information. And then the second question was around how can we make sure that governments are taking this seriously and governments are involved. Governments will not take this seriously, and governments will not be involved if we do not let them know that it is a top priority. So everything from petitions, phone calls, letter writing, letters to the editor, getting it out there front and center so that people know in government that education is important and that people are going to be voting based on that is, is extremely powerful. And so I think the more and more that we can come together behind this common mission, you know, World at School, if you sign up for that email list, they will send you email blasts and we do different petitions. And we've done ones there where we've had over a million people um, sign up you know, on different petitions. And one of the most fascinating ones that I've been involved with is when we partnered with several organizations, including Avaz and Change and uh, a few others, Purpose, I believe, and it was right after the tragic um, shooting of Malala Yousafzai in last year, about this time last year. And Gordon Brown, as UN Special Envoy for Global Education, traveled to, um, to Pakistan. And, and I was there with him. And we went one month after the shooting of Malala. And we went with us with one million signatures from people around the globe that wanted to tell the Pakistani government they needed to stand up and do something more for education. What was really exciting is when we got there, Bela Jamil, who runs an education organization in Pakistan, had another million signatures from, from people in Pakistan calling for the government to do something on education. And so together, we had over 2 million signatures that we were able to present to the president. And within um, two days of us leaving, 
um, the Pakistani parliament voted to make education free and compulsory for all children. And to that date, education was not free and compulsory for all children in Pakistan. And it was because people stood up for something that they thought was wrong and let their voice be heard. And that is what really shifted uh, political actors. And so I think that just demonstrates the power of people coming together on these causes to really influence government. Justin, thank you so much. To give people a couple of minutes to take a break before the next set of sessions. If you'd like to clap for Justin, it's hard to find the clapping icon, but hover over the smiley face, go down to applause. Thank you so much. I put your contact slide up on the screen so people could contact you directly. There, was, there were one or two questions that didn't get answered. I'm hoping that people can reach out to you independently. Great. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. It's, it's been real great to speak with all of you. I look forward to, to joining up with all of you as we move forward to get every child into school and learning. And be sure to get in touch if you have other questions. We'll be happy to answer them.